Okay, here we are continuing with chapter seven, 7.4, which is trigonometric functions of any angle. Um, so let's go ahead and get out. I apologize if you could hear the planes over. I do live right next to Randolph Air Force Base. Randolph Brooks Air Force Base or Randolph Air Force Base. So every now and then they're doing their flight testing or whatever it is, practice, I don't know but I can hear the planes all day long. Um, so don't mind that. I do think this blocks out a lot of the sound. So I'm gonna go ahead and continue and share my screen so we can see my camera. There we go. So 7.4, the first thing that it starts with is just kind of going over the definitions again. So it says, let theta be any angle in a standard position. Standard position means that the um, vertex of the angle will be at the origin and its, term, its um, initial side will always be on the x-axis, okay? And then you'll have a measurement here, which is A, its length is A. And then depending on the angle, if it's an acute angle, it should be somewhere in between um, zero and 90 degrees, but if you have an angle like that, um, it kind of ends up looking like this. So here's the vertex, here it is, and then it opens up so much. And so then now you have a point here, and if you draw this down, you have a right angle, okay? And so then the X measurement is A, this height here is B, to be half of the diameter, which is your radius, okay? So it says um, R would equal again by the Pythagorean theorem should be uh, square root of A squared plus B squared. So let's find all the different um, things here. So remember that sine is opposite over adjacent. So it would be B over R, opposite over hypotenuse. Cosine is adjacent over hypotenuse, so that would be A over R. Um, tangent is the opposite over the adjacent, so B over A. Cosecant is just the reverse, the uh, reciprocal. Of equals zero. Right. If the A was zero, then you'd be here at the center and it wouldn't even be an angle at all. Or if B was equal to zero, again, you'd be here at the center. And so then you'd be, you wouldn't have any angle at all. Um, it says find, actually if B was zero, it would be down here. And that is an angle, it's an angle of zero. Now, find the exact values of any of the six trigonomic functions of a positive angle theta if the point is a point on the terminal side. So I'm gonna draw that. So at one, two, three, four, and then you've got one, two, three. So that's down here somewhere, okay? Which means, remember how um, angles work, they go clockwise. So what's happening here is you've got an angle that started here and it's going all the way over there, okay? Now, That angle. I don't even know, need to know what the angle is as long as I know that point on which the terminal side um, lands. It's going to be B, which is the Y coordinate, over R. Now I have not calculated R. So R equals the square root of A squared plus B squared, which is 16 plus 9 square root of 25, which is just 5. So my R value is 5 for this particular problem. So then cosine of theta is going to be the x value 4 over 5. Tangent of theta is going to be the um, b over a, so negative 3 over 4. And then now all the others are just reciprocals, so negative 5 over 3. Secant, 
will be 5 over 4, and cotangent will be negative 4 over 3. And that's all of them. Now, example 2 is the same thing, except now, again, we have a positive angle. So x is negative 3 now, and y is positive 3. So now this time I'm here. So the angle is there. Now, let's figure out what r is. So r equals the square root of negative 3 squared plus 3 squared, which equals 9 plus 9, or the square root of 18, which equals 3 squared to 2, if I simplify that, right? Uh, square root of 18 is 3 squared 2. So let's do all of our trick functions. We get sine is the y value over the radius, which is 1 over the square root of 2 or square root of 2 over 2. Then we have cosine is going to be the x value over the radius which is negative 1 over square root of 2, which is negative square root of 2 over 2 after rationalizing. Tangent is going to be the y value over the x value, which is negative 1. And then we have all of the reciprocals. So cosecant theta is going to be 3 square root of 2 over 3, or just square root of 2. Secant theta is going to be oops, um, 3 square root of 2 over negative 3, which is negative square root of 2, and then cotangent. Oh, you can't see me. Sorry. Cotangent is going to be. Um, so all I'm doing is taking the reciprocal here. So the reciprocal of this is this, and the reciprocal of cosine is this, and then I reduced them. And then the reciprocal of tangent is negative 3 over 3, but so still get a negative 1. Okay, so I'll put my battery real quick. And we are good to go now. Okay. So example three wants us to fill in this information. Now, again, I'm using the unit circle, okay? So I cannot draw a circle ever. Um but imagine that's a nice, pretty, perfect circle. <laughs> um, it, and I put let r equal 1. So we're talking about the unit circle again. So it says that if you're trying to find the sine, remember, if you're at 0, if the angle is 0 degrees, then it's here. If you open up to a 90 degree angle, pi over 2 or 90 degrees is here. If you open up all the way, the 180 degrees, you get there. And then if you open up, three-fourths of the way there, you get three pi over two, um, and so forth. And so then I've written the coordinates for each of these numbers because they are on the axes. So if the radius is one, that means from the center out, this is one measurement. From the center here, this is one. From the center here, that is one unit. From the center here, that is one unit. So the coordinates of this point at zero is one, zero. The coordinates at pi over 2 are 0, 1. The coordinates at pi are negative 1, 0. And then the coordinates at 3 pi over 2 are 0, negative 1, right? There's uh, one unit for x, no units for y. Here you have no units for x, but you go up one unit for y. Here you're going left one unit for x, not up or down for y. And here you're not going left or right for x, but you are going down one unit to get to the y value, okay? So then remember, sine is like all of the x coordinates, cosine is all of the y coordinates, tangent is the x over y, and all the rest of them are just reciprocals. So let's see what we end up with. So for sine, we get the, I'm sorry, this is backwards. All of that's backwards, sorry. And I should know better. Sine is the y value, cosine is the x value, and this is y over x sine over cosine. So then the y value here is 0, and the y value here is 1, the y value here is 0, and the y value here is negative 1. Now for cosine, it's the x-coordinates. So the x-coordinate here is 1, the x-coordinate here is 0, 
the x coordinate here is negative one and the x coordinate here is zero. So then now when you do the ratios, for a tangent you get zero over one, which is zero, one over zero, which is undefined, zero over negative one, which is zero, negative one over zero, which is undefined. Then now you take the reciprocals. So if I have zero, that can be written as zero over one. But when I take the reciprocal of it, I get I get one over zero, and that's undefined, which is why cosecant is undefined. Here, if I take one over one and I flip it over, I still get one. And again, the reciprocal of zero is undefined. Um, here, if I take um, the reciprocal of one, I get one. The reciprocal of zero is undefined. And then the reciprocal of this is actually zero, because the, if I flip it over, that's x over y. And if I do take x over y, I do still get zero here. Now, let's see here. So again, the reciprocal of zero is undefined. The reciprocal of negative one is still negative one. Reciprocal of zero is undefined. Um, reciprocal of this is still negative one. Reciprocal of this is undefined. And again, if I flip over and I do x, over y, I get 0 over 1, which is actually 0. So now we have enough information to complete the unit circle, okay? So here's my attempt at drawing a unit circle. And so what you're going to do is you're going to assume that the radius is 1. No matter if I'm going out here, if I'm going out here, or here, or here, no matter where I'm starting, if I start to the center, to the edge of the circle, somewhere, anywhere, that radius is one. So essentially the lengths of every single one of these lines, including the axes to the circle, is all one unit, okay? And then now I'm gonna do my measurements. So this angle is actually zero, or if I go all the way around, it's two pi. We know that if I go by pi over fours, right? We talked about this in one of the first lessons. This is pi over four. This is two pi over four which reduces to pi over two. This is three pi over four. Four pi over four reduces to pi. Five pi over four. Six pi over four reduces to three pi over two. Seven pi over four. And then eight pi over two lands me back in. go by pi over six. So pi over six units here. Another pi over six would be two pi over six, which is pi thirds. Then three pi over six, which is pi halves. Then four pi over six, which is two pi over three. Five pi over six does not reduce. Six pi over six does equal pi. Seven pi over six this is 8 pi over 6, which reduces to 4 pi over 3. 9 pi over 6, which reduces to 3 over 2. And 10 pi over 6, which reduces to 5 pi over 3. Um, and 11 pi over 6, which does not reduce. And then finally, 12 pi over 6, which lands me back at 2 pi. So all my angles are measured. Now, I just know based off of the chart that I just received that here the coordinates are going to be, um, well, the coordinate there is one and zero. Here the coordinate is um, zero and one. Here the coordinate is negative one, zero. And here the coordinate is um, zero, negative one. I also know the coordinates because I know what the sines and the cosines are for each of these three. So for pi over four, I know it's square root of two over two. So all the pi over fours, I know the answers. I know the numeric values, okay? What I don't know is the signs, which we're gonna talk about in a little bit, but I can do the signs. 
The signs here would be a positive x and a positive y, so both stay positive. Over here, it's a negative x and a positive y, so I put my negative in front of my x. Down here, it's a negative x and a negative y, so I have both negatives. Over here, it's a positive x, but still a negative y, so that guy's negative. Then now for these. Now I know I have two choices. I know some of them are one half and some of them are square root of three over two. How do I know which is which, okay? What you've got to remember is that square root of three is bigger than the square root of one, right? The square root of one is one, square root of three is gonna be bigger. So this guy's bigger, which means when I'm located here, right, do I have a bigger x value or do I have a taller y value than pi over 3? Just look at that. It looks like pi over 3 is a lot higher than pi over 6. And pi over 6 is a lot further out to the right than pi over 3, which tells me that the coordinates here are going to be square root of 3 over 2, the bigger guy, and then the smaller y value. And then the opposite for the other one, so 1 half and then square root of 3 over 2. And so then you have to be careful here because if I'm at this height, I'm using this coordinate here. So one half and square root of three over two, but the X coordinate should be negative. And if I'm at this height, I should be using these coordinates. So square root of three over two and one half, but again, the X value is negative on this side. Down here, I am using the same X coordinate as this one. So I'm gonna use that same point, negative square root of three over two and one half, but the y value is negative as well now. And then the other point, one half and square root of three over two, but both the x and the y are negative in this quadrant. Over here, I need to keep the same y value. So I'm gonna keep the order of these coordinates here. And I have a positive x, but a negative y. And then for here, I'm gonna use this coordinate here, square root of three over two and one half. But again, I have a positive X value, but a negative Y value. So, um, let me see here. Okay, so that's it for the unit circle. Now, um, if I go back to the page where we left off, here it's talking about how you could have angles that are what we call coterminal. And so what happens is that the angle goes around and around and around and around. So if the angle were to only go this measurement, that would be the angle A. If it were to go all the way around and back there again, it's the angle B. Um, give me one second, sorry. So here we have some problems down there. Now remember, in order for the angle to go all the way around, it does go around 360 degrees or two pi degrees, okay? And it doesn't matter how many times you go around, they all still have the same terminal side. So they will still have the same coordinates, meaning they still land on the same place as the unit circle, okay? So, if I go over here and I have this, notice that this is higher than 360 degrees. So I'm going to say that that is equivalent to 390 degrees minus 360 degrees. So that's the same as sine of, three, of 30 degrees. And I know that the sine of 30 degrees is one half. You could look at the unit circle, you could look at the previous chart that we did in 7.3, um, but you should have this value. Or if you type in the calculator, it'll tell you that value. Now, cosine of 420, again, is bigger than 360 degrees. So that's minus 360 degrees. We get cosine of 60 degrees, which is going to be, um, again, one half. Then we have tangent of nine pi over four. Now, two pi is all the way around. That's the same as saying eight pi over four. So if I go all the way around, I can subtract nine pi over four minus eight pi over four, which is the same as subtracting two pi, which is also the same as subtracting 360 degrees. 
and I get that this is equivalent to tangent of pi over 4. And I know that for pi over 4, we get uh, square root of 2 over square root of 2, which is just 1. Or you can type it in a calculator, it'll tell you 1. Now for this one secant, notice that that one is negative. Okay, so they've gone downward. So then I need to add because it's now negative. Okay, so for these, I had to subtract to get them to have positive value. Here, I'm going to have to add pi to pi. Now, when I add 2 pi, because it's a force, I'm going to actually add um, 8 pi over 4, which is equivalent to 2 pi. So I get the secant of 1 pi over 4. And then that value is going to be the reciprocal of the x coordinate. So 2 over square root of 2 or 2 square root of 2 over 2, or just square root of 2. Or you could type it in your calculator and probably pop it out. Except when you type it in the calculator, you do have to be careful that you're using 1 over um, the cosine of the angle. So now we have this one. Again, it's negative, so that means I'm going to have to add 360 degrees, so then I get cosecant of six, no, that would be 90 degrees, I believe. Let me see, I might be wrong. Um, negative 270 plus 360 is 90 degrees. Positive 90 degrees. And so then cosecant of 90 degrees is one. And I looked above to figure that out, right up here cosecant of pi over 2 is 1. Okay, so that's it for that page. Now, um, let's see, now we're going to talk about the signs, which I kind of already have done. The quadrants are labeled 1, 2, 3, and 4. You go counterclockwise, just like the angles go counterclockwise, okay? And then the signs here are going to be positive and positive. The signs here are going to be negative for x, but positive for y. The signs in here are negative for x and negative for y. The signs over here are positive for x, but negative for y. Now, um, they say because of those signs, we should be able to figure out the signs for all of the trig functions in um, these different quadrants, okay? So remember, sine is the y value and cos, uh, cosecant is one over the y value. So the y values are positive up top and negative downstairs, which means that sine and cosecant are actually going to be positive in these two quadrants, okay? Then now they want us to do the same thing for cosine and secant, which use the x value, and then tangent, which uses both the x and the y, okay? So here um, for sine and cos, uh, that's going to be x, and this one's going to be 1 over x, whereas x is positive over here and x is negative over there, right? So cosine and secant are positive in these two quadrants. Now tangent is um, y over x, and cotangent is x over y. So if you've got a positive divided by a positive, then you're going to end up positive here. If you have a negative divided by a positive or vice versa, it's going to be negative. If you have a negative divided by a negative, you get positive. And if you have a positive divided by a negative or a negative divided by a positive, depending on which one of these you're looking at, you still end up with a negative. Okay. And so then I want you to keep in mind this little thing here. I learned it um, when I was taking pre -cal. So it's the way it works is the quadrants are there, right? And you say all students take calculus. And really, it's all STEM students take calculus because now the non-STEM people don't have to take calculus. But regardless, it still fits the situation, okay? So all means, if you notice, sine, cosine, and tangent, and therefore all of their reciprocals are all positive here, okay? And if you notice, the only one that's positive over here in this quadrant is the sine. The only one that's positive in the third quadrant is the tangent-cotangent relationship. 
And then the only one that's positive in the fourth quadrant is the cosine, okay? So that's one way to remember where the certain trig functions are, are positive, okay? So sine would be positive in these two, tangent in these two, and then cosine in these two, okay? So example five says, determine the signs of the trigonomic functions of an angle given the quadrant. So name the quadrant in which the angle lies. If sine is positive, so if sine is positive, that puts me in one of these two, and cosine is negative. Now I know that cosine is positive over here, which means I would have to be in quadrant two, okay? Because we know cosine is positive over here all and cosine by itself. So if it's negative, then that means it had to be in quadrant two. So you'll see a couple of problems like that in your homework. Um, I think those are the most fun. They're not really too um, lengthy as far as what all is involved in doing those, those problems. Um, okay, let me put my unit circle in the batch of paperwork. Okay, so now we have this page and um, it says, exam oh, okay, definition, denote an angle that lies in a quadrant, the acute angle formed by the terminal sides and the x-axis is called the reference angle. So notice that you could go all the way over there, but you could use this angle as the reference angle, okay? Here you could go all the way around over there, but there's the x-axis, so this is the reference angle. You could be all the way over here in this quadrant. The x-axis is right there. And then this one's a normal situation. Um, or it's saying if it goes all the way around a negative angle, right? Then you still have it, okay? Um, so essentially what it's telling you is that the negative angle of this is equivalent to the positive angle of that. At least the trig value of those will be the same, okay? Um, let me see. Okay, so for example six, it says find the exact value of each of the trigonomic functions and it says use the reference angles. So here we have sine of 150 degrees. So if I'm doing 150 degrees, here's 90 and then I would have to go 60 more degrees this way, okay? So if I went 90 and then 60 more, that means this should be 30 degrees, okay? So it says find the exact value of the tr following trigonomic using the reference angles. So basically what you're saying is what is the sine of 30 degrees? We know that the sine of 30 degrees is clear. Am I in degree mode? Yes, I am. So sine of 30 is one half, is one half. So that would be my y value, right? We know that this is a y value. Now, that would be if I were over here, right? The y value would be one half. But because I'm over here in this quadrant, um, it's actually gonna also be a positive one half. So the answer here is in fact, one half, okay? Now let's try this one, 510. The first thing I need to do is I need to go use the coterminal angle to begin with. So 510 degrees minus 360 is 510 minus 360 is 150. And then if it were anything different, you would do the whole thing all over again. We just got lucky because it's the exact same thing as that. So I know it's supposed to be one half. Um, but let's say for instance, it was um, cosine of, let me see. Let's say it was cosine of 45 degrees, 405. Or you know what, not even that. Let me do it even better. Or 95. So again, I could subtract the 360 degrees to figure out where it's landing. But then I get the cosine of 135 degrees. 
So if I go 135, here I go 90. To get to 135, I'm going to have to go halfway again. So this is 135 degrees, but to make the rest of the 90, that's actually 45 degrees. So what is the cosine of 45 degrees? The cosine of 45 degrees, that x value, is square root of 2 over 2. But that would be for the positive 45 degrees. But I'm on this side where x is negative. This is an x value. Cosine is an x value. So which means that the cosine of 135 degrees would actually be a negative square root of 2 over 2. Sorry, I got real tiny in there, but I should be negative square root of 2 over 2. There we go. Now, example 7 says, find the exact values of the trig functions with information given. So I know that cosine is negative 2 over 3. Now, your radius can never be negative because that's a that's um, a distance. It's not like you're on a coordinate system where you have positive and negatives like the x values and the y values. So because the denominator is 3, that tells me that the radius is 3. It also tells me that the x-coordinate, because cosine is corresponding to the x-coordinate, is 2, but it's negative. So I'm actually over here somewhere, and it does tell me I'm between pi over 2 and pi. Well, here's pi over 2 and here's pi, so that puts me in quadrant 2. So that means my point is somewhere in quadrant 2. I don't know exactly where. But I know this measurement, the radius of the circle, is 3. And I know this measurement is 2, but because it's in the negative direction, it's negative 2. And then if I draw that down there, I have this uh, right triangle. So then it tells me to find the exact value of the remaining. I am going to need to figure out what the y-coordinate is. So I'm going to have negative 2 squared um, plus who knows what that is, squared equal to 3 squared. So I have 4 plus b squared equal to 9, or b squared equals 5, or b equals the square root of 5. So now I know this is the square root of 5. And now we do the trig function. So we already have cosine. I need sine, which is going to be um, opposite over the hypotenuse. Then we have uh, cosecant automatically, right, which would be 3 over square root of 5. And if I rationalize the denominator, I get this fraction. Then we have tangent, which is the opposite over the adjacent, negative 2. And then if I do the cotangent theta, I get, flip it over, so I get negative 2 over square root of 5. And if I rationalize the denominator, that's negative 2 square root of 5 over 5. And then secant would be the reciprocal of cosine, which would be negative 3 over 2. And so we've got all six trig functions there. So then now we have example 8. So we have here this. Now again, this bottom number is going to be my radius. The top number, because it's sine, is going to be my y value. And the radius won't ever be negative. So that the y value is what is negative here. So that means I'm at negative 2 down here. And it says that I'm between pi and 3 pi over 2. Well, here's pi. Here's 3 pi over 2. So I'm somewhere in this quadrant. Now, um, I don't know what the x is. I'm going to go up to the x-axis. So I do know that the y, this side, is 2, negative 2. And I know that the radius is 3. What I don't know is the x value. So um, let's see that. So let's see. 3 squared equals a squared. Or it doesn't matter what letter you use there, really. 9 equals 4. Oh, I get the same value. 5. And so then b equals the square root of 5. So the x value is square root of 5. But it is in this quadrant, which is 1, 2, 3. And so then it should be a negative x value. 
Now let's find the remaining. We have sine, which means we automatically have cosecant, which would be negative three over two. We can find cosine by doing the adjacent over the hypotenuse. Then we can find secant by taking the reciprocal and then rationalizing it. We can get tangent by taking the um, opposite over the adjacent and then rationalize it. And then we can get the cotangent by taking the reciprocal of tangent. And that one doesn't really reduce much, so that is the problem there. Now, let's see, I have three problems that were a little bit different in the homework. So we're going to go ahead and go through those. So 7.4, number 16 says, find the exact value of each of the remaining trig functions. So here we've got secant. Now we know that secant is one over cosine, okay? So you've got one over cosine equal to two. If I multiply both sides by cosine, I get one equals two cosine of theta. If I divide by two, I get one over two equals cosine of theta. And then it tells me that tangent, so I know here that my r is two and I know that my x is a positive one. And it tells me that tangent is going to be greater than zero. And I know that tangent is greater than zero or positive here and here. But because my x value is positive, that means I cannot be over here. So my, my point is gonna be somewhere in this quadrant. So I know I'm going to be in quadrant one. And then it says find all the remaining. So I do know that the radius is two units. And I know that this width here is one unit. What I don't know is this side over there. So because this is one unit. So I know that's one. What I don't know is the y value. So r squared plus or equals x squared plus y squared, so that's 4 equals 1 plus y squared, 3 equals y squared, or y equals the square root of 3. So that is the square root of 3. And then now I can do all of the angles. So I know that sine is going to be the opposite over the hypotenuse. Cosine is going to be the adjacent over the hypotenuse, which I already had over here. Um, cosecant is going to be the reciprocal of that, so 2 over square root of 3, or 2 square root of 3 over 3. Secant is going to be the reciprocal of this, which is just 2. Tangent is going to be the opposite over the adjacent, which is just square root of 3. And then cotangent is going to be, sorry, cotangent is going to be the reciprocal of this, which is square root of 3 over 3. Now, the next example says if sine of theta is 1 over 8, find cosecant of this. Okay, so the first thing we need to do is know that this is um, r, so r equals eight, and we know that because it's sine, y equals one. So that puts me, let's see where that puts me. Sine is positive here and here, so then the y value is one. So that puts my point either here or here. I don't know which one yet, okay? Um, and so then I know that I know that my radius is eight and I know that my y value is one. Okay. I just don't know what the x value is. And you don't really need it because for cosecant, you don't need to know the x value. You just need to know the y value and the hypotenuse. And I know those. Okay but they're not asking me to find these, okay? What they're asking me to find is this is theta, or this could be theta, 
they're asking me to figure out what's happening at theta plus pi. So if I take this and I rotate it around 180 degrees, it actually ends up down here. So this one ends up over here, okay? Which means now the angle is over here. Radius is still eight and this value is still one. Actually, it's negative one now because it's a negative y value. Or if I'm looking at this angle and I rotate it 180 degrees, it actually lands over here. So again, this y value is now negative one, but the radius is still eight. So it really doesn't matter which one I'm looking at. Notice that the y values and the radiuses are exactly the same. So if I wanna find cosecant of theta plus pi, what I'm looking for is the radius over the y value. And it doesn't matter which one of these I'm looking for, looking at, it's gonna be eight over negative one or just negative eight. That one was really tricky, okay? Because you had two options, but it just so turned out that it wouldn't matter which one of them it was, you still end up with the same result which is why they didn't give you any extra bit of information um, other than just that. Okay, last example says, if tangent theta equals four minus secant theta with theta in quadrant one, what is sine plus cosine? So this one's really, really um, a doozy. Now the first thing we need to do is get this so that it just has one trig function. And the only way I know how to do that is if I manipulate it using the um, tangent secant relationship. So I know that um, tangent squared theta plus one equals secant squared theta. So in order for me to use that relationship, I do need to have squares. So I'm gonna go ahead and square both sides. And then I get tangent squared theta equals, now be careful when you square this. It means four minus secant theta times another four minus secant theta, which is 16 minus four secant theta minus four secant theta plus secant squared theta, or 16 minus eight secant theta plus secant squared theta. Then now I can convert. So I'm going to go ahead and, I already have secant and secant, so I wanna convert this one into secant. So I'm gonna minus one on both sides. So I'm gonna use this version of that relationship, that identity, right? So tangent squared is gonna become secant squared theta minus one. So then if I subtract secant squared theta on both sides, it cancels here and it cancels here. And then if I minus 16 on both sides, and then if I divide by negative eight, I get that secant theta equals this. Now remember, secant theta is the radius over the adjacent or the x value. Cosine and secant are the x, okay? So that tells me that the r is equal to 17 and the x value is equal to eight. And it did tell me that I was in quadrant one. So here's my point in quadrant one. And I know that the radius is 17 units and I know that the x coordinate is eight units. I need to figure out what the y is. So 17 squared equals x squared plus the y squared. What is 17 squared? That's 289 equal to 64 plus y squared. So if I minus 64, I get 225. And if I take the square root of 225, I end up with 15. So y equals 15. And then now I can give them what they're asking for. So they're asking for sine of theta plus cosine of theta. Well, sine I know is y over r, and cosine I know is x over r. 
So y over r would be 15 over 17, x over r would be 8 over 17, and if I add those together, I get 23 over 17. So no calculator should be used here. Um, it's all just using all the information that you've gotten so far. So being able to go back to using your identities to manipulate everything, using your x values, y values, your Dagger theorem, all of that business all put together um, gets us to the final answer. Now this video went just a little bit over 45 minutes, which means that together the videos are probably going to cover about an hour and a half of lecture, um, which is still not bad considering all the information that we've covered. Um, and then we'll continue next week with the rest of, or maybe some more of the chapters.